Well, conservative evangelicals appear to be fighting amongst themselves once again. So in this episode of Theology Applied, I'm joined by A.D. Robles in order to present everything you need to know regarding two particularly interesting feuds. One of these disagreements is between Jared Moore and Douglas Wilson on the subject of homosexuality and the doctrine of concupiscence. The other is between William Wolfe and James Lindsay over the ever-controversial topic of Christian nationalism. Although James Lindsay is not a Christian, there appears to be a surprising number of conservative evangelicals taking his side of the issue. Buckle up, this episode gets a bit spicy. Applying God's Word to every aspect of life. This is Theology Applied. All right, welcome back to another episode of Theology Applied. I am your host, Pastor Joel Webman with Right Response Ministries. And today I am privileged to have for the 947th time, A.D. Robles, a regular on the show and a personal friend of mine. A.D., thanks for coming on. Excellent. Thank you uh, for having me. I, I, I asked Chat GPT here how I should introduce myself <laughs> on a podcast, and uh, it's just taken too long to think. So yeah. I'm glad to be here. It's like John Henry beating the steam engine. You know what I mean? It's like it can't keep up with a true OG podcaster. You know, there's just there's no substitute for blood and bone and marrow. Yeah. So yeah. that's, right. that's, that's right. why we got you on here. Otherwise, you know, in the future, as it perfects itself, I'll just interview chat. What is it called? Chat GPT, yeah. Yeah, I'll just start interviewing a computer, you know. Why not? But for now, but for now, we're gonna continue to use people. Um, all right, so <laughs> what you flesh it out because we were talking, you know, before we hit record, before we went live, um, about what we're, you know, what are we gonna discuss? And you had a really great idea. Yep. So you flesh it out. Give us the framework for this episode. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm glad to do that. So my first idea was was just talking about, you know, how to how to sort of handle and navigate and 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 argue. Uh, amongst ourselves as, as Christians, you know, when solid Christians, you know, we're, we're believers, we love the Lord, you know, we have differences of opinion on whatever it might be, how to best do that, how to fight well. Um, and then, you know, it, it, the other thing that, that we talked about was, uh, was about um, just Christian nationalism. They go together because there's a lot of fighting going on about that. Right. People are very nervous and concerned about Christian nationalism and, uh, and so, yeah, let's let's do it. Yep, I yeah, I can completely agree. Real quick, for the outset, um, I think it's helpful for our listener to know where what what do we mean by Christian nationalism. So, for, I'll speak for myself, and then and then you give any kind of distinctions that you might have, you know, because even our two views, I think they're pretty aligned. But just in case they're not, I, I'll I won't speak for you. I'll just speak for me. But for, when I say Christian nationalism, I'm perfectly happy to say, yeah, I'm a Christian nationalist. Like if somebody asks me, hey, what, you know, what yeah. is your theology? I don't volunteer necessarily Christian nationalist. If they say, are you a Christian nationalist? I'll say, yes, let me define the term. So I will say yes to that. I prefer to just say I'm a post-mill theonomist, right? So, but you know, Christian nationalism, it'll do. Um, so I would agree with like Doug Wilson, where he says, you know, I wouldn't have picked that term out of a hat, but if somebody's going to throw it on me, there's plenty of things that they're going to say that are pejorative yeah. that I, I have to defend against. But then there's some that you know, it's like, well, I can actually work with that that term. I can actually defend that position. So, Christian nationalism, the way I see it, Doug describes it very, you know, very similar light. But you really have three options, and then there's you know two sub options underneath underneath each one. So six options total. Um, you've got uh, you know localist. Uh, like tribalism, and then you've got you know nationalism, and then you've got globalism. I'm not a globalist. Um, George Soros is just too cool for me. I'm not invited to any of the parties. <laughs> I don't eat bugs. You know, I, I did when I was a kid actually because it was a good way to get attention. You know, like first grade. You know, you go on your summer camp with the church, and and all the other kids are like, oh my gosh, he ate a bug. You know, so but I haven't eaten bugs in a long time. I swore them off when I was a child. I acted as a child, but I've grown up and put those things behind <laughs> me. So I, I'm not a globalist um, I, because. First and foremost, I'm being facetious, but but biblically, I believe in the goodness of sovereign nations, uh, that God actually appoints borders. He's sovereignly, so it's not just people get together and make those plans. That That's a human agency, but God actually, in his sovereign decree, actually uh, institutes the lifespans, the days, the time of nations, the Bible says, and its borders. And we see again and again and again the, the, uh, the sovereign rights of nations to police their borders, defend their borders. The sojourner, you know, or the stranger that we see in the Old 
Old Testament. Uh, we do eisegesis. We being, of course, not you and I, but like gospel coalition types will eisegete in their illegal immigrant. That's not actually the word in the Hebrew. Um, it's mm-hmm. somebody who entered through the walls legally. This is not a fugitive. This is somebody who legally came into Israel, the nation, and is going to assimilate in their cultures. They're going to be expected to adhere to the Sabbath laws, all these things. Even guys, merchants who want to sell to Israel, who aren't even inside on their land, who are outside the gate, Nehemiah tells them, if you come back on on the Sabbath again, I'm going to lay hands on you and beat you guys. You know what I mean? So it's just, it's insane. So anyways, all that, all that said- Yeah, that's right. So the point is nations are totally biblical. And then tribalism, there's nothing wrong with a local mindset. You and I, you know, we live in a a particular place. We think about the nation, but we think about the world in one hand, but we're also thinking about our city, our county, our county, our state, even smaller than that, our neighborhoods, and of course our our households. So that's fine, but that's that that doesn't function um, in terms of you know, this tribe of 40 people, you know, because they're constant, they're, there's an instability. They're, there's not a stable, secure, you know, it's there's constantly, we've seen tribalism at work in distant uh, past and, and in other places still to this day, they're always at war. Um, it, it just doesn't work. So tribalism or localism versus nationalism versus globalism, the biblical model by far uh, seems to be nationalism. So then the question is, is it going to be pagan or Christian? Pagan tribalism or Christian tribalism, pagan nationalism or Christian nationalism, pagan globalism or Christian na- or, or Christian globalism. So we're saying nationalism seems to get uh, the lion's share of biblical support. So we're going with that one. And then it's a no-brainer for the second question. Is it Christian or is it God-hating? It's Christian. It has to be Christian. Pluralism yes. is, is <laughs> it's, it's anti-Christian, right. right? So in that sense, right. I just wanted to define my terms. When I say I'm a Christian nationalist, what I believe is the goodness, the biblical goodness of sovereign nations and the right to police their borders and adhere to yep. certain customs, but with Christ Jesus being king over all of it, and they must obey his will, which we find in the law word of God Every jot and tittle, none of it will pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away before every any jot and tittle of the law. So we have the full law of God. Certain points have been fulfilled by Christ, like the ceremonial law. It's all been fulfilled, but fulfilled and abrogated the ceremonial law, but the rest remains intact. And those things need to continue to this day. And Caesar is God's deacon, God's servant, serving under Christ as the high king, and he needs to do his bidding. That's what I think of when I, when I say I'm a Christian nationalist, that's what I mean. I think that that's not a theonomic position. It is, uh, but I think that's just the Christian position. I think anything less than that yeah. is not Christian. What do you think? Yeah, I, I try to keep it very simple. You know, I, I, I think that when you, when, you, when you just break it down, you know, our nation and all nations should be self-consciously Christian. That's what they should do. That's the good thing. And so everything about the nation should be Christian. So they should have Christian laws. They should have Christian uh, traditions. They should have Christian customs, morality, education. Everything should be Christian. And and we should be self-conscious about that, trying to do the best we can to be as Christian as possible in every area. And what I mean, and, and that necessarily means that we're not making any accommodations for any other mor- moral perspectives, any other religious perspectives. So in other words, you know, y- you could be a Muslim in a Christian nation, but you're not going to get Ramadan off. We're mm. working. And if you don't want to work on Ramadan, that's up to you. But we're working, you know, and we're taking Christmas off. And if you don't want to take Christmas off, that's up to you. But we're taking it off. Mm. There's no accommodation. So in other words, so in other words, you're the exception. To the, if you want to live here, that's fine. But you're the exception to the rule. And we're not going to have Muslim laws. Right. So if you don't like that, tough, because that's that we're Christian, self-consciously Christian nation. We're not going to have pluralistic laws. We're not going to have laws that that um, that uh, are, are accommodating LGBT perspectives or things like that. No, we're having Christian laws because we're a Christian nation. That's what we should be doing. That's all I mean. So as a Christian, I'm trying to make the nation as Christian as humanly possible. Right. Right. Amen. So with that, you know, in brotherly disagreement, <laughs> those kinds of things, uh, you know, like we've seen some debates lately and some of them yes. have been, you know, in good faith and, and there's been charity, um, not, not yes. weakness, right. It's, there's been, you know, good courage and faithfulness and somebody really, you know, sticking to their guns. We've seen some of those debates lately, uh, but we've also seen some debates that have not gone very well, um, in the Twitter sphere and other places, and uh, and a lot of the ones that have not gone very well seem to be about this topic of Christian nationalism. So when you thought of this topic of, let's talk about how to disagree as brothers, 
um, especially from you know reformed brothers. How do, how do we disagree with one another? What what did yeah. you have in mind? What, where, where do you want to go from here? Yeah, definitely. Well, what I what I actually was thinking about when I had this idea uh, is is the debate that we we saw between uh, Jared Moore, Doctor Jared Moore. He is a doctor, I think. Uh, whatever, well, Pastor probably. Jared Moore. That's that's a better title, Pastor. Yeah, anyway, that's a better. So, one. Pastor Pastor Jared Moore uh and 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 pastor doug wilson or i guess he's reverend doug wilson <laughs> um and and basically the the controversy was you know about uh same-sex orientation homosexuality and the orientation of you know being a homosexual you know what i mean that that kind of thing and whether or not that you know that orientation was i don't know part of original sin or something like that it was just very 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 specific kind of debate because i don't think anyone would say that doug is pro uh, gay Christian, right? Like that's not like what people would say about him, but there is some difference in opinion there. And so I just, I just, that's why I thought about it. Cause I saw a lot of people arguing about that where it was very good and helpful and I think necessary. Um, but I did see some like overheated type stuff too, where it's like, yeah. Oh, he's just soft on this. He's just a heretic and stuff like right. that. I saw a little bit of both. <laughs> and right. so I, that's why I wanted to kind of explore it a little bit and talk about a uh, talk about how to do that the right way because i think it's necessary you got to have those fights i'm right. glad Doc, uh, pastor jared moore brought this up because yeah. i think that issue needs clarity if any issue needs clarity that one does definitely and i think the the reason that it got brought up is you know so like mutual friend of you and i john harris you know had jared moore on his show before he hosted the debate you know for you know informal organic you know discussion slash debate between you know doug wilson and jared moore but first john did an episode where he had jared moore they're talking about concupiscence which to define that it's basically sin at the level of desire which is clearly a biblical principle we find in the book of james you know uh, that that sin ultimately it gets its start in our desire right why, why do you sin is it not because of your evil desires you know you covet and do not have so you commit murder so these things can be tracked back to the level of desire that's where sin begins and so so sin is not only sin once it manifests itself outwardly in terms of our actions or our speech uh, but we can sin at the level of thought and we can sin even at the level of desires and certain urges and doug wilson had some material on the record from the past that jared moore threw out there saying you know well on this con concupiscence issue and guys like you know revoice you know who are saying it's cool to cuddle you know with your boyfriend as long as you don't you know uh commit sodomy you know those kind of you know guys who are just straight up gay those guys are gay they should not be in the pastorate they they really shouldn't even be granted membership in a local church unless they repent of that and actually reject that identity they're still identifying as a gay christian which is like being a jumbo shrimp you know or intelligent joe biden it's it's an oxymoron that's just not it's a misnomer and so there's there's problems with all of that but for me it's like jared moore threw him out there and cited some of Doug Wilson's older work. And, and one of the things that I just want to consider, because when they talked, when Jared Moore and Doug Wilson actually talked together on John's show, um, Jared Moore was super respectful and he, and he kept pressing Doug in good ways that it, where Doug needed to be pressed. Um, and he did it respectfully and those kinds of things. Um, but initially I was just like, all right, well, wait a second. Um, this, this needs clarity. It needs to be brought up. Um, but I think it should be done so respectfully. And one of the things that should be considered, I'll just, I'm going to be frank. Um, you and I are not in this problem. John Harris is not in this problem. I don't know about Jared Moore. I don't know lo how long he's been in ministry or had a public platform. But one of the reasons we're not in this problem is because we didn't have any notoriety or any platform or really any recorded material from from 12 years ago or 10 years ago. Like, I don't, like, if if, if there were, I had some old sermons um, you can't find they're, it. They're pro they're probably awesome, right? Uh, nope, they're deleted. <laughs> they're they're gone. You know, down the memory yeah. hole. My doing. I did. You know. So my point is like, when you have someone like Doug Wilson, who's been ministering for the most part very faithfully for forty something years at this point, uh, yep. you're just you're going to have some things on record where it's like you missed it, and not just you missed it. Sometimes there's like you didn't even completely miss it, but they're like. The whole culture and even church culture was thinking in a different direction. So, like when Doug says, "Like sure. we have gay Christians, you know, in good standing," 
um, in our, you know, he, Doug even admitted, I would never say it like that again. That, but that wasn't, that just wasn't a part of the conversation. We were not collectively thinking about what that meant and all the implications. And I see now why that is not a helpful phrase. I would not say it like oh, that sure. again, but you're, you know, you're going back to 10 years. So anyways, what, what do you think? Yeah. Well, I think here's the thing, I, you know, I, I, I appreciate, um, the the willingness to kind of because doug is really good at this like anyone who's ever had a problem with him you know if you want to discuss something with him and go back and forth and kick some ideas around or whatever he's willing to do it you know what i mean and i i respect that about him um and i think that sometimes so 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 here's the thing my my read on on the whole situation is a little different and and maybe it's because i didn't really see uh, a lot of the back and forth right away uh, but I, I thought Jared was pretty respectful. I think that, right. you know, there were some bombastic things said. Um, and some of that, in my opinion, is to grab some attention, to get some attention to it, which I think is is valid. Um, but what I'm more concerned with, not so much as how like how Jared um, kind of brought attention to it. I'm more I'm more concerned with like as a bystander, as someone who's watching this, what do I then go and do? What do I think? Like. Do I, do I, do I, do I follow this thread? Do I, do I pursue this? Do I think about this? Do I just get really offended and stuff like that? Cause I, I actually thought a lot of the debate that I saw was super healthy and super respectful. And I'm glad to see that the, 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 the debate that they did on John's show, I haven't actually watched that in its entirety yet. I'm glad that you, th you thought that was respectful yeah, too, was. because yeah. th th that's really good. Cause it's necessary to do that. Right. Um, one thing that I, 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 I'm glad also to hear that, that, that Doug said he wouldn't, say that again right he wouldn't say right. it that way right i can understand that because there's just certain terms that that we we can see with clarity now that are, are so uh slippery that we didn't see at the time right right what i what i what i what i what i what i fear though and this is what i wor worry about sometimes is where you kind of like you you i'm not saying doug did this but but this happens a lot with evangelical debates where they have something that they said that they regret saying, but they don't actually take it back. They just right. want to pretend it never happened. I know. See, that's what we can't do. That doesn't sharpen anything. Right. That just muddies everything, you know, where it's like, ah, you know, like it's out there. You don't, you just pretend like you never said it and you change direction. That happens all the time. Always. And that's like what, what I think needs to be avoided like the play. Cause that's, it's not, it, and, and, and some people are like, well, it's, you're not repenting if you're not acknowledging it. I, yeah, I guess that's true, but I'm I'm more concerned with like the accuracy here. So if you if you change your mind, that's okay. Tell me why. You know what I mean? Right. That's I'm talking about like sharpening the like like respecting and 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 sharpening the people because we need to understand the clarity here. Right. I'm glad Doug said he wouldn't say that again. I'm I don't know if he said, if he explained why, but I can easily see why you wouldn't want to say it that way again. Right. Um Yeah, I think yeah, yeah no, you're right. Like the accuracy, truth matters. Um and and actually telling us why i think that's really helpful you and i have talked about that before but being able to say all right this is what i said this is what i'm yeah. saying now you might notice that the, <laughs> the two contradict one yeah. another there's a difference here and the reason why i've changed on this position is because dot 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 um yeah. and the reason why the why matters is because um because it's not just that issue that's uh, ultimately uh, within the light of concern. It's uh, oh, I, I want to see that you're the type of person who can think biblically, um, and and actually is able to you know eat eat crow from time to time and exercise humility sure. and be thoughtful and these kinds of things. Because if I see you change on a position and and you tell me why, wh how did you how are you more sanctified today than you were? when you yeah. when you made the original remarks how are you more mature how are you more uh, theologically astute how have you grown how have you improved um if you can convince me of that or even at least give like some some basic reasoning for why or just acknowledge it some people exactly. don't even acknowledge that they've changed right which is like, like just, I, I think of al yeah. moeller right like he's now this bastion for cr christian nationalism right. apparently and he doesn't even acknowledge the fact that he's was totally woke yesterday right like it's like it's like it didn't even happen. It's just it's just a ma it just magically goes away. Like that's what I want to avoid, and and that's why I I, I kind of wanted to talk about this because I think that even if you disagree with Doug Still, which I think a lot of people do, I don't think anyone can say having that conversation on John Harris's show wasn't healthy. That was totally healthy, and that yeah. was great. And I, and I had some great comments on on one of my videos recently that said 
that they think they've pinpointed the the actual disagreement because there's a lot of agreement but then there is actually a substantive disagreement yes and he kind of pinpointed it and, and 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 i think that that's healthy man when someone can look at the debate and say i like these guys both of them and now i think i figured out why they disagree that's so helpful yep you know what i mean and oh dude it was helpful just, for me because you know like i i I like Doug Wilson. And so, I, you know, naturally, sure. my, I have a presupposition. I like Doug Wilson because I like what he said on other issues and blah, blah, blah. So I found myself just, you know, from the outset, I'm wanting to agree with Doug. I want him yep. to be right. And hearing the dialogue between the two of them was really helpful for me because, you know, and I'm happy to say this publicly. And part of the reason I'm happy to say this publicly is Doug has enough humility to, like, if I disagree with him on something, he doesn't care, you know, and he'll, he'll still, you know. He'll still come interact. on the show. Exactly. He'll still come on the show and we still have some measure of relationship, <laughs> which is great, you know, because he's, yeah. he's not a, you know, snowflake. So all that being said, though, like uh, Jared Moore, you know, you know, slowly whittled him down to get to exactly what you're expressing, to get to that, okay, here's actually the disagreement. And I was like, yeah. dang it, Doug's wrong. I disagree with Doug. I, I agree with you. Because, because what it came down to is just the initial urge. Because Doug kept giving like this example. It was, he did say exactly like this, but in principle, this is what it was. So it was like, well, if I got a guy, you know, who um, has, has a, a moment of temptation, you know, to, to look at gay porn, right? And, um, uh, but he, you know, uh, is very quickly, you know, in 15 seconds, he shuts that urge down. Um, he, you know, he, he was on the laptop, but he doesn't click on anything and he, he closes his laptop and, um, then, you know, praise God. Um, and he doesn't need to confess that. Um, and, and Jared Moore just kept pressing. He's like, well, and, and, and the, and the example kind of changed to where it's like, um, well, if there's a guy who just has one second, not 15, that was crazy, you know, like, <laughs> but one second and, you know, but then Jared pressed again and said like, but that's, that urge is the sin. That urge sure. is that one second, the, the yeah. sin. And Doug saying, well, that's the sinful nature. And I would have a, yeah. a few problems with that. Number one. Yep. Um, yes, we have a sinful nature. We believe in that. We're totally depraved from the womb um, until Christ saves us. Uh, but one, we have a new nature now. We're new creatures in Christ Jesus. Uh, sin still resides within the members of our being. That's Romans 7. So there's still a sense of what sin, but this is something people need to understand. According per Romans 7, and the way that I would read Romans 7 as somebody who's thoroughly reformed on, on the doctrine of total depravity and these kinds of things, um, Romans 7 is is essentially saying that that the Christian is not totally depraved. And I think that's something reformed guys need to get out of the, you know, it's like, well, I'm just totally depraved. Are you saved? Because if you're saved, you're not totally depraved. Now, you, what you still have is you still have the flesh. And, and as sure. long as we're in this life, we still have the flesh and there are sinful yeah. desires which reside within the members of my being. So my flesh still has a propensity towards sin, uh, but that's different than the sin nature. They un See, the unbeliever has the flesh and the sin nature. So to use like an analogy, if you're thinking like an egg, right? You got the egg white and you got the yolk, um, you know, and, and let's say they're both bad. You know, like um, the 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 unbeliever has the the white, you know, the white, you know, uh, egg white, and that's yeah. the flesh, and and that's bent towards sin. It, it has a propensity towards sinful desires, and then they've got you know the yellow egg yolk, and uh, and that's the sin nature, and it's also bad. Well, the Christian still has the the egg white and the fleshly sin. Sin still resides within his flesh, but the yolk has been transferred out, and in its yeah. place is some chocolate goodness center or whatever, and that's that's different. But the problem is that the last thing I'm going to say is just the problem that I, I think of is um, sin. Yes, sin still resides within the members of my being. I don't need to confess 24 seven for, for having sin within the members of my flesh. Um, but there's something to be said for uh, when, when the urge becomes conscience and that's what Jared put his finger on and said, but, but wait a second, like, because because you're not just talking about going through the day as you're, you know, as you're driving in your car to work or as you're yep. um, kissing your daughters and praying over them as they go to sleep. You're talking about a conscious, um, specific moment where you had thoughts, conscious thoughts of desire. To, that's what you're repenting of. You're yep. repenting of that moment of of desire towards this thing, and then the last thing you add on top of that. Um, and and on on top of it all, this is not um, a desire that's out of 
bounds in terms of degree, like like um, I, I'm I'm desiring two wives, and you know sure, uh, sure. instead of one. No, this is an unnatural desire. That's what Paul says in Romans one. Even for the the unbeliever, this is debased and unnatural. Men exchange yeah. natural relations with women and be, become inflamed with lust for one another. So we're talking about not just an urge. Uh, but a conscious urge that you feel that you're you're mentally aware of thoughts are involved, even if it's a second, and an unnatural one at that, which is shameful even among Gentiles. And we're saying yeah. that that doesn't need to be confessed. And just to be specific, I'm not saying that you need to sit in a confession booth for three hours like Luther used to do before he got saved, but we're talking sure. about confessed at least to the Lord, to the Lord yeah, in oh, prayer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That oh, was yeah, Jared's absolutely. position. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't I can't disagree with that. And and so here's the thing, and this is why this is so healthy for us, because you know, we I'll be honest, okay, I'm just gonna be straight up, keep it 100 percent honest with you here. So when I saw this controversy, uh, I kind of was like, oh no, infighting again. That's kind of my that was my initial reaction, right? And Jared had already kind of requested to come on my channel and I was happy to have him because I'd had him, we had had him on Reform Jellical when that was a thing a long time ago. And um, anyway, so I was like, almost like, oh no, and he's going to be on my channel now. Now I'm going to get in this controversy. Like I was almost dreading it for like maybe more, a little more than 15 seconds. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll give you that. It's a little more than 15. But when I thought about it, you know, a second time, I was like, you know, that reaction where I just don't want to cause any trouble. I have that. I believe it or not, I have that reaction all the time. I, that we we got to sometimes just swallow, you know, take a deep breath, you know, take a nice good hard swallow and just be like, look. This we need to figure this one out. We need to hash this out into it's not that I hate you, it's not that I hate we hate each other. It's not that we're going to all be in a, you know, firing squad shooting each other and stuff like that. This is the definition of ironing iron sharpening iron, and it's not necessarily a peaceful process all the time. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen somebody make a sword, uh, uh, Joel, but it's violent. You know what I mean? There's there's hammering, there's sparks flying, it's yeah, there's heat. And so if that's the if that's the imagery we have for sharpening each other, you know, how you would like sharpen a sword or make a sword, um, it's okay to let the sparks fly a little bit, just so long as you're committed at the end of the day uh to to the church and each other. You know what I mean? Right. You know. I think that I'll be honest, man. I've I've got like a a very I, I when I was younger, I had a very effeminate training on how to deal with conflict and how to deal with this kind of stuff. Um, but I got you have to reject that kind of stuff, especially as as men. You know, I know you probably have female subscribers too, but mostly probably male. Mostly, male. Um, we've got to we've got to reject that. And recognize that, you know, at the end of the day, like guys, guys, guys and girls communicate differently. So if you grew up with mostly female teachers or female, um, you know, Sunday school teachers and stuff like that, there's a chance that your view on on conflict is a little skewed. Right. right? Um, we can we can guys. I don't know. If, I don't know if I told you about this one, Joel, maybe on the last episode. I can't remember. But I saw this uh, this this post on uh, on Gab or something like that, where there was this guy who had a before and after pick. He was really fat before. And then he was like, he was fit, you know, it had been like a year, he exercised. And he said, I finally decided to get control of my weight after my friend called me a fat, obese idiot every day for a year. I finally <laughs> decided to do it. And, and the thing is like, that, that doesn't compute with women, right? But that guy knew, that friend knew that, yeah, he was calling him a name, you know, and maybe a little more colorful too than that. Right. But he knew his friend loved him. He knew his friend had his back. He knew his friend didn't hate him. He knew his friend didn't want bad for him. And so it, you know, it took a little sparks, but it, it got him. It got him. And now he's, you know, a normal weight and he's got a, a healthy way of looking at food and everything. And uh, he's very grateful for his friend who called them names for a year straight. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Gu gu guys have to do this a little differently. And I think that sometimes, we, because let's just face it, a lot of us grew up in churches that had, we had a lot of female influence, a lot. Right. And even the males sometimes acted like females. Right. Like, I think fighting is good 
And I think we just need to make sure that we have that commitment. Like my brother is never worried when I fight with him that I'm going to say, I never want to see you again. He's not worried about that because he knows I'm his brother and I've got his back. And that's how it should be. You know what I mean? Yep. So let's talk about another disagreement that did not go that way. Uh, that seems to be still going on, at least as we're recording this. Um, so it may, you know, the, the scuffle could be worse by the time this episode airs, or it could be just, uh, you know, long forgotten. But on Twitter, uh, Twitter. Mutual, mutual friend of you and I, uh, William Wolf, who I think I, I could be wrong, but isn't, isn't, doesn't he work with Al Mohler? Isn't he an intern with Al Mohler? Yeah, it was wasn't he like the head intern or something? I think I he know. helped like, him with I think he helped him with like research with the briefing or something like that. At least while he was there cuz he was going to uh Southern Seminary, yeah. but he's graduated now and um That's and, like being the head elf for Santa. Yeah, like being the head elf for Santa. <laughs> yeah. Um so anyway, so William Wolf is a solid guy and uh and I've had him on the show before and I know that you've interacted with him also and he's very active on Twitter. I can't keep up with him. I think he it seems like he posts like like 100 times a day. It's insane. Uh, yeah, I, um, I so, definitely don't keep up. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's way too much. <laughs> but I have noticed um that James Lindsay, uh so conceptual James, he's uh the renowned atheist who the Lord in his common grace used um, and I don't know, I guess it started in like 2017 maybe or so that, that yeah. at least that he started yeah. kind of coming out on in the public sphere and, uh, and really, you know, just decimating critical race theory and wokeness. And that was a gift to the church, praise God. And, uh, he really teamed up with Michael Fallon. Michael Fallon's a guy who kind of, you know, was, was using him and bringing him to certain things. And, uh, and so I've learned a lot from, uh, you know, James Lindsay in terms of, uh, how to, uh, refute critical race theory, how to refute the whole DEI, you know, diversity and equity and, you know, inclusion. Um, really, really helpful stuff. James Lindsay is good, I think, at identifying the problem and, uh, and then just blasting it. But he doesn't have a solution, in my opinion. Sure. And there's probably a decent reason for that. One of the reasons would be because mm-hmm. James Lindsay hates Jesus. And I think that's mm-hmm. important for us to remember uh, Romans yeah. chapter eight says the mind of the sinful man is hostile. It's not neutral. Neutrality is a myth. And that's precisely where James and I would disagree. But neutrality is a myth in biblical terms. Uh, the mind of the sinful man, if you're not born again, if you don't haven't been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, or Christ alone, then your mind is in a state of enmity and hostility, not indifference, not neutrality, but enmity and hostility yeah. towards the law of God, the things of God. Uh, you cannot submit to his law uh, nor will you. Yeah, he doesn't submit to his law, so it's not something you will do, and it's not something you can do. And that's ultimately, if we're thinking biblically, that is the heart and mind of James Lindsay uh, right now, as far as we can tell from every outward appearance by his own admission, um, unless the Lord in his grace saves him. So all that being said, sure. James has been helpful on the problem. He's not super helpful on the solution. William is saying, um, we need Christ, and we need Christ as king. Uh, not just, you know, uh, just right. an ethereal Jesus, you know, uh, best buddy, yeah. you know, who we, you know, I've got my little Jesus in a box and I take him out from time to time, you know, to help with internal problems, ethereal problems, emotional problems when I'm depressed or when I'm anxious, you know, or to pray for a loved one if they're not doing well. No, we need Christ as political king. We need him ruling with an iron scepter. Uh, we need Caesar to submit to Christ per Romans 13. He is God's deacon. The state is not a neutral sphere. The civil sphere, like everything else, is is either for Christ or against him. And so we need the state, the civil sphere, to be in submission to the lordship of Jesus Christ, which of course, an atheist, shocker, doesn't like that position. (laughs) Of course, of course he doesn't. Sure. You know, but the crazy thing is like how this is unfolding online. So, you know, you're, you're looking at these posts and it's, and it's just like William saying something here and saying something there. And he's snippy, he's snarky. So it's not like William's not like some little church mouse. Like he's 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 ferocious yeah. and he's going after it. Uh, but then James Lindsay is responding like, you're a little B-I-T-C-H. And that's the response, <laughs> like straight up. And it's like, okay, so that's not yeah. how we that's not how we disagree. You know, and, and then there yeah. are Christians still backing Lindsay in this. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's it's weird. It, it's very weird. It's very weird. 
you know, it's the opposite the of Jared Moore and, and Doug Wilson is what I'm saying. So we're giving two examples, well, right? So like I'm, one's I'm, a good one. I'm, one's a bad one. And I'm very glad that it is the opposite. Cause, because here's the thing, like, obviously the Bible, the Bible talks about how we should strive to be at peace as long as it, as much as it depends on us to be at peace with people, right? We don't want to cause problems. We don't want to cause, uh, you know, fights just for the sake of it. But the thing is like our, our mission uh, is going to cause problems because the thing is like, you know, people who hate Christ don't like hearing that he's the king and we have to actually act like it and we have to order our lives according to it and all of this kind of stuff. And they, they, they really don't like hearing that. And so um, there is really no peace between us um, so long as we're on, on this mission, right? You know, we can, we can be friendly with guys like James Lindsay. You know, honestly, uh, he he always seemed like the kind of guy that I could grab a beer with, you know, and and hang out and yeah. and and chat with him. That's what he seems like. I mean, I don't know if he's like that, but but that's what he seems like. Um, but at the end of the day, w w we're just coming at at this from completely different planets. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Very different planets. And so, um, any any agreement we have on on anything, you know, is it's it's really kind of just agreement on the surface more than anything and so of course you know it's not surprising to see responses of like like that like where right. he's just kind of cursing and you know you know making jokes and stuff like that, that that's not surprising um I, they're really it shouldn't look the same as jared versus doug wilson right. because it's a total, they're, they're, they're just com coming at it from completely different perspectives. Well, we have a different standard. That's, a completely that's what it different comes standard, down to. Yeah. We have a different standard for everything that we do, including how we disagree. Like there are Christian right. standards for ev everything in all of human life, including uh, disagreeing with somebody else. And James Lindsay doesn't have that standard. In his position, he wants to, you know, to defend with every bone in his body to his dying breath. Um, yeah. No standards. That's his. But that, that's that's what he wants to give his life for. Is that um, that you know, like yeah. that freedom of speech means absolute freedom of speech. You can say anything. <laughs> yeah. Always. When, when the reality is, it's not. You know, Rush Dooney is so helpful. It, just that whole you know catchphrase of it's not whether but which. There's always going to be a reigning sure. orthodoxy. There's always a, there's always going to be a theocracy. See, that's the crazy thing is that like oh well we don't want a theocracy. Um, what do you think the, the branch Covidians for the last three years have been all about? You think that's yep. not a deity? That's not a religion? Of course it's a religion. It's certainly not science, right? It's the science, TM, right? Which is sure. which is a religion. It's, there's nothing scientific about it. You know, take the booster, do this, do, like and with without backing anything up. And if you disagree, what what happens to you? Well, you get freedom of speech. No, you don't. No, you, right. don't. you get shadow banned, you get blackmailed, you lose your job, you get kicked off of this, you know, all these different things. So the point is there, there's, there, there's never a, a, a perfect freedom of speech. And I, th I think, I, I think what, what we have to realize is again, it's not whether, but which there's always a reigning orthodoxy by, by way of consequence, um, whatever the orthodoxy is, things that are outside of that, especially things way outside of that, are going to be labeled as blasphemy. And there's always going sure. to be some penalty, whether it's a cultural, like society uh, penalizes you, you know, by by just, um, we, we're not going to interact with you anymore. You don't get invited to our, our gatherings anymore. You're losing friends over it, or whether it's a civil penalty. Sure. So whether it's a social penalty, more organic or a formal civil penalty, there's always an orthodoxy. There's always blasphemy. There, There's always a standard. It's not whether, but which. And there's always a God. That standard flows from the God. There's always a theocracy. This idea that we don't need theocracy. Let's just do this classical, you know, liberalism. Let's just do this. But no, th there's always a God. There's always a God. Yeah. And and if, if there is no God truly, uh, then government is the God. Government is the theocracy in and of itself. It becomes the deity. And so to me, it's inescapable. Uh, but guys... Guys still keep pushing back and not not so this charitably. Is the, this is the thing, like like J James Lindsay, just to stay on him for a second. Like you 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 had to see this coming, right? So you what you said was perfect. You know, he's really good at identifying problems, right? Yes. He might not know exactly why it's a problem, but but at the end of the day, he does have some moral compass because God created him to have one, right? So so he has it because God put it there. And um, he's inconsistent with it and he's not going to be, you know, he's not going to, 
He's not going to serve, you know, God. He's going to do whatever he wants. But but he does have some stuff, so he can he can know the difference between right and wrong. We we all understand that. So he's good at that. But we all, I thought, to be honest, Joel, I thought we all kind of knew that like there'd be a limit to being able to you know use Joel's or I'm not it's not Joel's uh, James. James's stuff. Right. Exactly. But 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 the more time passed, the more. I didn't see any limits. Like I, I saw him, you know, talking about what pastors ought to do. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Right. Dude, we're not in, we're not on the same team. You, you, pastors shouldn't do anything because you think they should do it. Like, what are you even talking about? And then he starts talking about theology and how, you know, right. some people are not Orthodox. And I'm just like, there's no, there's no breaks on this train. Is there? And, That's and the hilarious. Thing is, maybe yeah. we, maybe we were naive, right? Like we shouldn't have even, maybe you know let him in the the circles in the first place but but the point is like like you can be friends with him you can use his stuff you can use his material but but make sure you're just using it and not leaning on it right because he's got nothing for you as right. far as a replacement for this he's got right. no way to beat this i saw he he kind of laughed at something i said about his little tantrum he's had the last few days and it is a tantrum he's having a little tantrum and and he he said that his only goal is that when guys like me fall off the cliff, that he maintains the movement. And I didn't respond to that, but like, what movement? I'm not, nobody's, we shouldn't be in your movement. Right. I don't know what your movement is. I don't know how you even have an atheistic movement. I don't even right. know what that's supposed to even mean. But like, I want no part of it and no Christian should. Movement. You're holding together movement. This is the thing, like, Andrew Torber gets a lot of, gets a lot of uh, grief. But one, he said a lot of right things. And one of the right things he said is, unfortunately, and I say fortunately, but if you're not a Christian, you cannot be a leader in this. You just that's can't. Right. Yep, that's you're right. You're not on the same page. We can work together to stop transsexual story hour. Right. But that's about the limit. You right. know, we can't really, beyond that, like, I'm glad you know that transsexual story hour is bad. But like, you know, beyond that, we really don't have much to do with each other. Right. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, that's absolutely mm -hmm. right. Uh, James Lindsay is Deborah, I think is the way that I would say it, right? So uh, Deborah, right? Every Those are fighting words, every, man. Every, I'm a girl. Every feminist, you know, every feminist, feminist, you know, heretical theologian and egalitarian. They love Deborah. Right, they love Deborah. So Deborah, you know, <laughs> for the listener, if you're not familiar, she was one of the judges when there wasn't a king, right? So things are chaotic. During chaotic times, uh, sometimes there's, you know, everybody's doing what they see as right in their own eyes. There's no king in Israel. Every man does what is right in his own eyes. Um, things are chaotic, and a lot of the men are being cowardly, especially those men who are in positions of authority, uh, who are allowing for the chaos to happen, who aren't actually leading, who aren't standing up and defeating the enemies and all these kind of stuff. Um, and I think it's Barak, I think is his name, but Barak was the general at the time, and he asked Deborah oh, right. yeah, to, yeah. to go with him into battle. A woman, right? He's like, hey, will you? I mean, you know, it's just even in 2023, I feel like that would be embarrassing. You know, like if if there's yeah. like some kind of battle, and you know, and I'm going and asking my wife, hey, w would you come with me? Uh, you know, like <laughs> we, we need to go and fight this. Th these there's two guys over there, and we need to fight them. And uh, would you would you come with me? Because I could really use your help. I'm nervous to go by myself. Right? That's just. I mean, that's yeah. <laughs> that's embarrassing. It's shameful. And Deborah says as much. She says, I'll go. But just know that the glory, you know, the glory will go to a woman, right? And, right. and you know, and what she's saying is like, I'll go with you. Um, but you really shouldn't be asking me to go. This is not, this, right. this is kind of shameful. And so my point is this, uh, James Lindsay is Deborah. And what I mean is um, James, it's like, well, how did we get a James Lindsay? Where did he come from? I'll tell you where he came from. He came because uh, all the barracks, Al Mohler, Russell Moore, Tim Keller, Right, the list goes on. Mark Dever, right? David Platt, all, all the barracks. Matt Chandler um, wouldn't wouldn't do anything. They just right. they wouldn't do right. anything. And and so and so here comes Deborah, right? And so my point is, okay, so so Deborah comes in and and wins the day and actually defeats, you know, because because here's the deal. Yeah, there's plenty of wokeness still going on, but the, it's changed. We need to be honest, right? Because some of us on the conservative side, we need to be honest about this because because we're building our platforms and our ministries off of wokeness. And I don't want to be that guy. I don't I don't want 
Um, I don't want to be uh, secretly rooting for for my enemy to to stay in power so that I have something to whine about so that people watch me on YouTube. I want wokeness to die. And if I can, if that eradicates, like we don't really need Joel anymore, and what, like, fine, praise God, praise God. Um, and I think if we're if we're going to be honest, I think wokeness is on its last leg. I think it's on its way out. And I feel like something has shifted from 2020 with, with the summer of love and mostly peaceful yeah. riots, and the whole country was on fire. And George Floyd, Saint George Floyd, and and now uh, in the beginning of 2023, it's different. There's plenty of woke guys still out there. I get it, but it's different. You can say things now. You, the, the Overton window has shifted. It has officially 100%. shifted. You oh, can 100%. say things now. I am saying things now, and I don't get near as much flack as I as I would have just three years ago, two and a half years ago. And so my point is, um, praise God for Deborah. Praise God for James Lindsay. He's a big part of that. Um, and and the Bible says, give honor to where honor is due. And that's not just for Christians. If a, if an unbeliever does something that's honorable, praise God. So so I want to give him honor for that. And I want to honor Michael O'Fallon for bringing him to the table. And Michael O'Fallon, I'm sure even if Michael O'Fallon was on, on this podcast, he would say, yeah, he wasn't the first guy I was looking for, but I'm looking at all my SBC guys that I trusted over the years and none of them are anywhere to be found. So yeah, so then I have to get, so J- James Lindsay is God's indictment of big Eva. That, that's what he is. James Lindsay is, is God's indictment of big Eva. But here's the problem though. Um, God's judgments are, are, um, well, you just, when God sends a judgment, it's, it yeah. squelches evil, but it also, it also shames the cowardly righteous who were standing on the sidelines. And now we're into the shame, uh, right? So God right. uses the hammer of James Lindsay, the Deborah, you know, the, the indictment against big, even their cowardice and all these kind of things. And he crushed up wokeness. Um, but now we, as Christians, we have to deal with James Lindsay because he's been let in the door and given prominent spotlight right. because all these other guys who the barracks who should have been fighting weren't fighting. Um, and and now we're we're trying to say, well, okay, but here's the deal. We we our goal was not to get back to the 1990s. <laughs> like our goal's yeah, a little, right. little bit bigger than that, right? Yeah. And, and we're not even trying to get back to 1776. We're, we're not trying to get to a principled, uh, principled pluralism. We're not trying right. to, because pluralism, just for the record, our listeners need to know this. Pluralism is just a euphemism for poly uh, polytheism. We're not polytheist. We're right. not polytheist. We are Christians. We believe in one God one God over heaven and earth, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's where, and, and James Lindsay is not going to take us there. And the only reason James Lindsay was helpful at all is because we got so far off the rails. And I'm talking about the church judgment. When God sends judgment, it starts with the church. The church got so far off the rails that an atheist who spent his early life trying to take out Christianity, the new atheist movement, I mean, hating Christ, an atheist was was an improvement from... from <laughs> <laughs> Say it like that. A guy from the new atheist movement trying to take out the church as his life's mission. We got in such a bad position as the as the evangelical church. That guy was an improvement on the Southern Baptist <laughs> Convention. You know what I mean? Like that's you know to, yeah. if I can put it that way. But now, by God's grace, as the Overton window is shifting, as guys are starting to have courage, as as we're starting to make some headway, uh, James Lindsay is saying, "Oh, well, this is. I'm sorry, guys, we're done. This is as far as we're going." And we're saying, wait, F- wait a second, we're going further than that, right? Fight, fighting, fighting with James Lindsay is completely different than fighting with Doug Wilson. Completely different than fighting with, um, with, uh, with Jared Moore, because you know in the Bible it talks about you know sharpening each other and all that kind of stuff, and you know as as brothers, you know we need to, you know we need to, you know if somebody's in sin, if somebody's doing something in error, we need to confront them. You know maybe you'll win your brother, that kind of thing. We we've got so many verses we could draw from about how to deal with each other, right? We're supposed to love one another, especially the church within the church, we're loving one another, right? That's how people know we're the church. But fighting with James Lindsay is totally different because because. One of the things that James is very like, you know, upset about, um, and I understand from his perspective, is that you know St- Stephen Wolf in his book said that you know atheism will be stomped out in in a Christian nation, crushed. Yep. And and that is not controversial in the slightest. Right. Atheism will be crushed. Yes, of course. Every a- any anything any any group or organization that doesn't mean we're going to hunt down atheists and just kill them for no reason. Like that's not what we're talking about. But th- they will have no influence, none. That's right. In a Christian nation's our traditions, our laws, our customs, 
and all that kind of stuff, right? Our right. education, no, they will have no influence. That's the goal. And the thing is, so when you're fighting, so he doesn't like that. He's very upset about that. But the problem is he's a fool. And so the Bible tells us how to deal with him. You don't answer him uh, lest, lest he, you be just like him. So you don't act like he acts when he calls you a little, you know, or whatever. You can bleep that out. Sorry. <laughs> um, you don't respond in kind. You know what I mean? You don't make fun of him in that way. You don't, you know, rip him in that way. You could zing him, obviously. I'm not saying you can't zing him, but, you, you know, but you, you don't answer a fool, you know, according to his folly, lest you be just like him. But you do answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Right. He needs to be put in his place is yeah. bottom line. He's not as smart as he thinks he is. He's not as clever as he thinks he is. In fact, he is a fool. I cannot think of a, a, a less respectable position to hold than atheism. It right. is the least respectable position That's you can right. have. It makes much more sense to be a Muslim. It makes much more sense to be even a, 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 a um, what, what is the one from Utah? Mormon. Oh, Mormon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mormon. It makes more sense to be a Mormon. It makes no sense to be a Mormon. It makes no sense to be a Muslim. But it makes more than atheism is is the bottom rung. You, you if you if you have a creator who's made himself known in everything he's created, everything, and you re, and you decide, you know. What? I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to reject that. Th that's as foolish as you could possibly be. Right. right? And, and so, just real quick for the record, for the listeners, AD is using the word fool in the proper biblical sense again and again and again. Sure. The Bible says the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Sure. The fool Absolutely. says in his heart. Th that's, so the guy who says there is no God in biblical terms, fool is the exact word that has to be used. R.C. Sproul used to say, you know, we celebrate <laughs> fools once a year on April 1st. Right. And, you know, and, and right. right. April fool's day. And so he, you know, he said April 1st, it should be called national atheist day. Right. And so April yeah. 1st, we can, you know, we can get James Lindsay, you know, a birthday card and send it to him in the mail or whatever, like, because that is the fool, according to scripture, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And we don't need fools leading the way. And if fools led us and helped us to destroy a, a bigger fool, right? That's what it was. It was a smaller fool destroying the bigger fool. All that means is like, well, th thank you. We, we, we can, we can be thankful for that. Um, but, but we don't then go and make him King, right? So, so if Deborah goes with Barak, uh, it's the, to the shame, it's not to glorify Deborah. Um, it's, it's an indictment, uh, to the shame of Barak. And when they come back and win the battle, what you don't do is you don't then, uh, make Deborah queen. You don't crown her and say, and now, uh, we're we're gonna have a gynocracy. We're we're now we're gonna be led by the, the having this woman win one battle worked so well that now we're going to be underneath female leadership, a female dictatorship for for now on for the for the rest of Israel's future. No, that that's not what you do. What you do is you say thank you, Deborah, and then you say shame on you, Barak, and and may this never have to be needed again. That's and, what you and do. And the thing is, like, I, I and and we don't have to pretend like like you know. Listen, do I want James Lindsay to be, you know, at Tom Askell's church one day and hear the gospel and for God to change his heart and for him to accept the gospel? Absolutely. Right. I, I absolutely do. And if James was just going to go quietly into the night and, you know, you know, I, I just take my hat off to him and I would I would never speak his name again. I, I don't know him like that. Right. But I'm sure people around him do. And and they, you know, they're they're ministering to him and they're they're preaching the gospel to him and all that kind of stuff. I'm sure they're doing the right stuff. I'm sure Michael Fallon is doing the right stuff that he ought to be doing as a Christian. But the reality is he's not going quietly into the night. The reality is that he's decided to take up arms. He's yeah. decided to fight. And when the fight comes to you as a Christian, I mean, you meet him, you meet him there. That That's your mission. You know what I mean? And so um, he needs to be put in his place. He needs to be defeated. Um, his arguments, I read through some of them and it's just like, I remember this because I used to, you know, argue with atheists in, in, in public and online. I used to, I used to go to colleges and, and argue with, you know, punk atheist kids, you know, they thought that were, they were the smartest things ever. I remember this. This is the old village atheist stuff. Right. I get it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like, it was always there. It was just kind of put off to the side when he was focused on this woke stuff. Right. But the reality is he's a village atheist and needs to be dealt with. And I, 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 you know, listen, I know he's got people, Christian, solid Christian people around him. And I, and I pray that they're reaching out to him because um, what he's doing now is just, it's embarrassing is really what it is. Yeah. Yeah. 
And the pro- I think part of the problem, though, is that um, I want to be careful with how I say this, but part of the problem is that um, if every Christian went to James Lindsay and said, friend, because um, you're not a brother, but friend, uh, you're under the just condemnation of God. You, you need to repent of your sins. And what you're saying now, you've helped us this far, but you're not helping us anymore. Uh, what you want to bring us back to culturally, politically, uh, philosophically is is exactly what got us here in the first place. That leads to this, and we're not interested in just winding back. The, the, we're we're not just we're not just interested in somebody who who can take us from stage four cancer back to stage two. We want someone who can cure cancer. Um, but the problem is, not every Christian is saying that. You, you, like mm. Christians, we're divided uh, because mm. we don't want the same thing. You and I, A.D., see, you and I, we want Christ as king over not just our nation, but every nation in the world. We want the nation, the nations are his heritage. Uh, we want the nations to flock to him, to, 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 we, we want, we want the whole earth to be covered with the glory of God, with the knowledge of God as the seas, as the water cover the seas. We, we want, um, we want his rule. We want his reign. And we, and we want to see his will done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, but it's yeah. not just that we have a, um, a disagreement on that point with, with James. We have a disagreement right. on that point with the majority of evangelical Christians. Yeah. The truth is that there's a lot of Christians that are public atheists. In other words, they in their public life, there's literally no difference. Yep. between them and the classically liberal atheist and the classically liberal Muslim and the classically liberal whatever, Mormon. Um, there's literally no difference in their public life. And that's a big problem. <laughs> that, that's a huge problem. And um, one of the many reasons why this thing has to be hashed out, you know, aggressively. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Well, so Doug Wilson, Jared Moore, good, good way to disagree. That said, I found myself on Jared Moore's side, which was a bummer because <laughs> I love Doug. I mean, I, Doug Wilson has been so well, faithful and done so many great things. Well, and this is so, the, this is know. the thing, Joel. But I did disagree I, with him. I, I find myself in a great spot because I um I I've I've disagreed with Doug I think twice, and this is one of them, and the other one was something to do with COVID lockdowns, and I gotta say I've come out on top both times. So oh I mean, wow, I'm look great. at you. So the see that's the beauty is um, if if you want to be <laughs> when I pick all the battles exactly I you, win a hundred percent of the time <laughs> exactly if you want to be Doug Wilson superior what you do is like right because there's a trillion theological positions and implications so what you do is you haven't thought of half of those you just read what he thought about it and say yeah that's pretty good that's my position thanks for doing all the legwork and then on the two positions that. and then on the two positions that he actually is wrong on is probably only two on those you say look at me so I'm just as good as Doug Wilson. Wilson plus two, you know, so, plus two. Yeah, yeah. So maybe it's three. I don't even remember, but yeah, that's, that's how you do it. Right, that's, that's how a, you do it. That's, that's how a, you write about everything. That's exactly. You, you just, only you just ride, ride his coattails on every issue for the last 40 years, except for two. That's, that's where you take the opportunity to distinguish yourself. There's Doug Wilson's of the world. Yeah. We're grateful for those guys, but then there's me. <laughs> anyway, so, you but know, that, that was a good, that was a good way to disagree. Doug was wrong. And we're not saying it's a yeah. good way to disagree because because in the end of that disagreement they came to the same conclusion. That's not what we're saying. We're saying what, what yeah. the whole point of this episode is to say it's not that Jared Moore and Doug Wilson disagreed well because they eventually came to the same conclusion. No, that that the episode left off with, with you know when they got on there with John, they still disagreed. But it was good because number one, we got to substantive arguments to where someone like you or I, right, the third party watching, could actually learn yeah. something. It was actually helpful and useful, and it helped me figure out what I thought about that uh, particular issue. And it was charitable. It was loving. Nobody was saying that Doug's a heretic, right? A ton of people say that, but they weren't. The, the guys in that not, conversation not were exactly so. So I, I, you know, and Doug, Doug wasn't calling them heretics. That was good. And then the James Lindsay and William Wolf and the other guys who've jumped in the ring, right? Everybody's, you know, seems to get in a tiff every now and then with James Lindsay. And, you know, I, you know, me and I had Stephen Wolf on my show, uh, not William Wolf, but Stephen Wolf, who wrote, you know, the, the case for Christian nationalism. And I remember James Lindsay, as soon as he got out of Twitter jail, uh, you know, he had, he had had like a, um, 
he, well, he just posted it. You know, he like shared the link of, of me and Stephen Wolf uh, interviewing him on his book, you know, about Christian nationalism. And he said, uh, these are the, the fed ops, you know, who, who, you know, whatever, like, this is a, this is a, a I, psyop or what, it, I don't know what he, but he was literally like saying, un, this can't un, be real. It's, un, it, it's unreal. It's like, I'm telling you, it, it, it's just so amazing. I don't know, Joel, if you spent any time arguing with atheists. I, Like I said, I, I went to college campuses. I even went to that atheist uh, rally in D.C. they held, uh, the Reason Rally. I went there. Um, and I, rem- I just remember listening to some of the speeches and talking to people. And it's just like, these people think they're so smart and they're idiots. <laughs> they're really actually pretty dumb, a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And, and and then you see, like, James, he's, he's obviously intelligent. He's yes, a good communicator. And 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 this thing has turned him into, it's a psyop. Everything does. Like he's gone. Right. He look, he's look. He sounds crazy. Yeah. Like, and, and and the thing is, like, I'm sure there's agents involved in various things. I I, I still believe that that whole situation with um, with um, what's his face? Uh, it's not even worth mentioning. But that whole controversy with uh, Stephen Wolf's friend and all oh, that. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that there was. I think there's something going on there. Um, I can't prove it, so I can't really give you why I think that. But, but, but I, I'm sure there are some like ops going on. I mean, why wouldn't there be? These guys are sick. Right. But like, he just sounds crazy now. He, now he sounds like a village atheist. This is the right. old school stuff that I remember back in the day. Them talking about. Right. Do you ever read his? Is, do you ever read Joel the uh, the handbook for creating atheists? One mm. of his one of his friends wrote that. Mm. that uh professor uh peter bogosian yeah i know who that is yeah but i i know so that's one of, uh, him and james are pretty close i think he wrote this book called a, a, a manual for creating atheists it's basically he he envisioned I, I i kid you not this is this is where these guys are at mm-hmm. he envisioned creating you know how like we have a lot of street preachers joel mm-hmm. and you go out you preach the gospel you do you know apologetics a lot of times and those conversations come up um he was going to create what he called street epistemologists to go out and convert people into atheism. Uh, you know, and, right. and he, they were street, they weren't street preachers. They were street ep- epistemologists. He wrote a whole right. book about it. And it's like, you're crazy, dude. <laughs> you're actually a nut. That's what you are. Yeah. You're well, he, he just, well, it's, it's exactly what Jesus says. You're either for me or against me. There is no neutrality. And I think that's, what's important to remember is that at the end of the day, the person who is not with Christ is somebody who, um, they, they don't want just uh, a neutral playing field where everybody can, you know, go along to get along. No, uh, no they, they want to convert people to atheism. They, they want to spread uh, the joy of hatred of God, right? That, that you know, they, yeah. that, that's, that's and they what pro- they want. And they promise you freedom. You'll be a free thinker, you know, and things like that. It's pretty evil. Um, it, you know, I'm joking about it because it just sounds so stupid, you know, street epistemologist. But it's pretty evil. And I'm not saying, I'm, by the way, I'm not saying Lindsay was associated with that. I don't know that he was or not. I'm just saying... Like this is the level, like these are like the big thinkers in atheism. This this is what we're dealing with. Right. So it's like, yeah, which you're is, create an army of street epistemologists. I'm sure that's going to get off the ground. Do you remember when they tried to do the, the church thing? They were going to do the Sunday meetings. Do, do you remember that, Joel? No. They had a whole movement called the Sunday meeting, and it was going to be just like church, but not church. They were going to have a, a motivational speech uh, with a, an intellectual person. They were going to sing songs, atheist songs, uh, unto the atheist <laughs> God. I don't, I don't know. Maybe maybe like rock song. I don't know what they were going to do, but they, they, they envisioned this whole thing where we're going to have Sunday meetings for atheists. You want to know how long that lasts? Probably, <laughs> probably, probably two weeks because two it's weeks. stupid yep. and everybody knows it's stupid. Yep. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's still going on. There's, I don't know if it really lasts two it's, weeks, it's but funny, it's dumb. It's funny. You said the episo- <laughs> you know, the epistemologist, you know, like versus, street epistemologist. Yeah. yeah. Versus a street evangelist. How you said like how it's evil and and just just to clarify if somebody's saying well you're saying that's evil but you know the atheist thinks that you doing evangelism is evil this is why objectively they're not um, equivalent they're not equivalent because um, from the atheist giving you know and I'm not going to straw man it I want to steel man uh, the the opposing position um, the best that they could think is that uh, religion is oppressive right that, that religion is like a shackle so people who believe in the triune God. Um, you know, these are oppressed people, these are shackled people, and they're not as happy as they could be if they were liber- liberated from religion. But by James Lindsay's own position, by his own admission, um, Christians are fairly happy people in America. 
and the history of America being predominantly Christian and Christian people. And, you know, in the 1950s, these are people who are reasonably happy. So uh, you're, you're really, what you're talking about is with your street epistemologist is taking people who are reasonably happy, but maybe making them a little bit happier uh, because now maybe their conscience isn't beating them up quite as much. For the Christian evangelist, that's the street epistemologist, the atheist, for the, the street evangelist, you're talking about uh, saving people from going to hell for eternity. Right, so so we're going to have this this team of epistemologists to save people from being kind of happy, so that they could be really happy um, for for the next fifty years, and then they're dust, right? And that's it. Um, and then the other position is no, our motivation is we're doing this first and foremost in obedience to God, and then secondarily out of love for neighbor, because we're talking about the eternal state of somebody not being reasonably happy for fifty years versus really happy for the next fifty years, but uh, somebody for eons and eons and eons and eons into eternity under the just wrath of God, miserable, wishing that they could die, but not able to versus eternal bliss in the presence of the triune God forever. Like that's, that's the difference. So the point is, um, yeah, the, the, like it, the atheist could say of the Christian evangelist and say, I disagree with what you're doing, but you can't call it evil. You could call us insane. You could call us confused. You could call us wrong, but you can't call it evil. Um, not, not morally evil, ill-willed towards, but, but for the epistemologists, what, what you have to say for the street epistemologists on the atheist side, trying to convert, you know, a, a, an atheist evangelist, um, that, that really is uh, evil in the sense that you are, uh, you're going out and yelling at people and, and, and arguing with people and, and confusing people and all these things uh, for, for a difference that is nothing and at best, to steel man the opponent, uh, it's negligible. So, and temporary. I regret to I regret to inform you that the Sunday assemblies thing is still going on. There's not no. very many of them, but <laughs> it's still they they still happen. There's well, let's let's get th- back to me in two thousand years. Let's see if they can hit our record. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Oh man, the closest one to you is in Nashville. Sunday Nashville. assembly, Nashville. I'm surprised there's not one really in Austin. Dumb. Honestly, I'm surprised. Yeah, there's, there, there's 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 very there's so few of them. So. But uh, yeah, so I, re- you know, it looks really dumb. So at least it's, at least it's still dumb. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. All right. Well, anyway, so that's, you know, how do we, how do we disagree with people? We, we need to do it charitably, but, but charitably doesn't mean that, that we can't, you know, like we're using words like dumb. We're using words like foolish because these are biblical words. So the, the Bible talks about uh, being dumb. It talks about being foolish. It talks about stupid. The word stupid is used in the Bible. Um, not just fool, right? I've, I've used stupid before and people say like, well, I, I wish you would have said foolish, you know, because stupid is harsh and that's not a biblical word. Foolish is. Nope. Stupid is a biblical word too. That's in the Bible multiple times again and again and again. So we want to be charitable. We want to be respectful, but we also want to be biblical and we want to be courageous and we want it to hurt. We want it to hurt a little bit so that so that the fool becomes aware of their folly. But all of this ultimately is done in, in a way that um, is seeking the, 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 the highest and ultimate good of the person that we're disagreeing with. It's done in love. It may be sparks flying, iron sharpening iron, but it's done in love. And it's done with clarity, with substance, with yeah. argument, so that people actually, the bystanders watching are, are better having, having watched. They're actually learning something. And I think Jared Moore and Douglas Wilson did that. I think that the skirmishes with James Lindsay and William Wolfe and guys like that have not done that. And it shouldn't be a surprise because in one debate, you have two Christians. In another, you have Christians versus someone who in their inmost being hates the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should remember that. Well, yeah, ultimately, you know, obviously we're not trying to destroy, um, you know, Doug Wilson or Jared Moore. Obviously, we know that there are brothers. We're trying to help them. And it's honestly, it's the same with James. You know, we don't want to destroy him and we don't want to destroy. Um, we do want to destroy his arguments, but we don't want to destroy him. But James does need to be uncomfortable with his with his foolishness. He needs to be un- made to feel uncomfortable with uh, with his denial of christ and um and whatever that takes we 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 don't want to hurt him but sometimes it does take your 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 pride to be hurt a little bit um to to recognize your need you know people need to sometimes be brought to the precipice before the the solution the antidote the 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 way is is apparent to them you know I i know that worked for me i mean i needed to be brought to like the to the lowest I've ever been, you know, in order for me to to really recognize how depraved I was and how how 
how much need I had. You know what I mean? Yeah. The prodigal son needed that. The prodigal son came to the end of himself. And then he remembered, oh, wait, you know, like, you know, my dad is actually good. And <laughs> I can, you know what I mean? Like, I can actually right. live there, you know, like, right. and some people need that. And, and the thing is, like, you know, again, you don't want to, like, curse him out or, or mistreat him or lie about him or do anything like that. Um, but, but there is a certain amount of roughness that someone like that needs. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, it's there and he needs to be brought down a peg or two. His cleverness isn't going to save him. You know, his, right. his, his, his fake morality isn't going to save him. Like his, this mission, this movement, whatever he thinks he's leading, it's not going to help him at right. the end of the day. Uh, he right. needs to deal with his sin. And, um, you know, I, I hope, I hope the people around him are, 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 are loving him enough to potentially even walk away from him if they need to. Right. Yep. I hope so too. And the reason why it matters is because in James Lindsay's world, the two gay dudes who adopted two boys and sodomized them and trafficked them with other gay guys to sodomize, that can happen. And we don't like that. Mm. We think that those two guys should get the death penalty, that it should be a swift capital punishment, that they should be executed. Um, right. And I say that just to put it into perspective, I know that that's kind of dropping a you know a bomb at the end of the episode, but I say that to say um, what say standard least, yeah. what standard do you use to say that gay marriage isn't a thing, and what standard do you use to say that two gay married guys can't adopt children? Right, we have right. an answer for that. Gay gay dudes don't get married um, in in Christ in Christ. Uh, yeah, no kingdom. accommodation, no right. accommodation for that. And so they don't they don't get married, and they sure as heck. They wouldn't even get married, uh, but they sure as heck uh, don't get to adopt children. They, you know, because it's a, it's a, it's a pretty straight line. And it's not, you know, pun intended, but it's a pretty straight line from, you know, gay marriage to um, to molesting children. <laughs> you like that the yeah. pun huh? so but like it's a straight did, my, my so like you you can't be shocked right you can't be shocked that because it it is a perverse. Uh, a perverse lifestyle. So it's like, oh, well, you know, just because people are gay, like there are heterosexual marriages that, uh, yeah, uh-huh, and those are misnomers, right? Um, yeah, there are se- heterosexual marriages that have, um, that one of the spouses has abused children. That is true. Uh, absolutely true. Um, but the gay couple um, shouldn't come as a surprise. That makes sense. That's that's not a misnomer. That's not a fluke. That's actually just, the, that's just the consistent uh, continuance down that path, right? Were, were this right. perverted? Why not be a little bit more? And so my point is just to say that uh, James Lindsay, his world would punish guys for sodomizing uh, children, but it wouldn't stop two guys from getting married and it wouldn't stop those two guys from adopting children, which puts them in the very situation for something like that to happen in the first place. Um, right. By what standard? By what standard? That's right. So anyway. Good stuff, Joel. All right, cool, AD. Thanks for coming on the show. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Uh, AD, how, how can people follow you? YouTube, AD Robles, uh, R-O-B-L-E-S. Gab is my favorite, AD Robles. Again, I'm also on Twitter. Cool. All right. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. God bless. God bless.